Chapter 3, Basic Principles of Classical Conditioning. Part 4, Second Order Conditioning. In most of the examples we've covered so far, the unconditioned response has been a reflex or other unlearned reaction. Research subjects don't need to learn to blink in response to a puff of air, salivate at the smell of food, or vomit in response to food poisoning. All of those stimuli are what some behavioral scientists call phylogenetically important events, or circumstances where reacting in a certain way is important for the long-term and sometimes for the short-term survival of the organism. Sometimes this gives students the impression that the unconditioned stimulus must always be a reflex. In fact, that was the working hypothesis in Pavlov's lab laboratory for a while, but it isn't so. If you've read chapter three very carefully, you might have noticed when Mazur used the term initially neutral stimulus. Do you recall what it referred to? And why do you think behavioral scientists might prefer that term? Pause the video here and take a minute to think about your answer. When I first learned about classical conditioning, we were taught that UR and CR stood for unconditioned reflex and conditioned reflex. This made the distinction between conditioning and higher order conditioning a really important one, but it, because it implied that they involved different processes, although I'm not so sure that's the case. Higher order conditioning, including second order conditioning, didn't involve an unconditioned reflex or an unconditioned stimulus. Instead, it started with a robust condition response in response to one conditioned stimulus and established a conditioned response to a new initially neutral conditioned stimulus by presenting those two conditioned stimuluses together like this. So instead of an, a conditioned stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus, you have an initially neutral stimulus and a stimulus that already elicits a response of some kind. For example, in one of Pavlov's lab's experiments, they conditioned a salivary response to the sound of a metronome by pairing it with food. Then they continued presenting the metronome and food, but they also sometimes presented a new stimulus a black square along with the metronome. In time, the dogs would salivate a little bit with the presentation of the black square, even though the black square was never presented with food, the supposedly unconditioned stimulus. Personally, I like the initially neutral terminology because it renders moot a question that has always bothered me about just what makes an unconditioned stimulus unconditioned. When a dog salivates at the smell of food, is that really an unconditioned response or is it a conditioned reaction that is established very reliably very early in the dog's life by the association between the smell of the food and the satisfactory feeling of having food in its belly? Or maybe it's the uptake of nutrients and calories into the bloodstream and the response to feeling full is also conditioned possible to dig that kind of hole for any supposedly unconditioned response uh, without actually learning much about learning.